you everyone for coming uh, just here and uh, the people online, I don't see you, but uh, hello as well. So uh, as uh, Sandro said, uh, the idea is to give a general talk about uh, four of the main research lines I am working right now. Uh, some of you are already involved and, and, and some of them here. Uh, the main idea is to try to establish some collaboration so, so people can see what are the lines in which I'm working uh, right now. Not necessarily all of them are here, but these are possibly the most intensive one that you can say, well, this is a, a research line. And then I will uh, expand these four in uh, different uh, talks. Uh, if it's talks that I will then uh, give. So what are these topics? Okay, so this is uh, possibly one of the uh, oldest topics I have been working in, uh, in communicability, but now I will talk about communicability geometry in networks. Uh, the second one could be about non-local dynamics on networks. Uh, the third one is about degree bias dynamics on networks. And uh, the last one is about time fractional dynamics, surprise, surprise, on networks. So let's start by the beginning. So communicability geometry in graphs. So first of all, let me uh, start with the chore motivation. So suppose that uh, you have uh, three different nodes which are forming a network of contacts. So now suppose that one of these nodes, which I am marking here by red, produce a perturbation and uh, be open-minded about what perturbation means. I'm not talking about any kind of specific perturbation. I'm not talking about any specific physical process here because what I am going to concentrate here is in the topological influence that the network has in the transmission of this perturbation. So the question is how strongly it is perceived. This perturbation is perceived by these two other nodes in the, in the network. So suppose that we have a, a physical setup here and uh, this is the red node and uh, it produced certain kind of perturbation here. And this perturbation is registered by this other node here marked in blue or this one here marked in, uh, in yellow. So the idea is to see how easily propagated this perturbation is through the network by taking into account all the possible routes that goes from one of these nodes to the other node in the graph. So uh, it is important that you realize that this particular graph has been selected intentionally. Why? Because all the nodes in this graph has exactly the same degree. So it's a regular graph but all the nodes have the same closeness centrality, the same eigenvector centrality, and the same betweenness centrality. So you will fail if you try to figure out by centrality measures, which of these two nodes will be more influenced by this perturbation. So the idea here is to use the concept of walks in network theory and a walk is just a sequence of not necessarily different nodes and edges in the graph, such as one of them is consecutive to the other and you are allowed to do backtracking. So as you can see here, so this perturbation can go, uh, well, anyway, so it can go here, go back and forth and then go to the uh, final destination. And then this walk is closed simply if the starting and ending nodes are exactly the same. So we have a theorem since the 1950s that was proved that if A is the Jessen symmetric of the graph, then the number of walks of length L <coughs> between the corresponding nodes V and W is given by the VW entry of the Lth power of the Jessen symmetric. So this is a very, very strong uh, result. You can prove this by induction. You can find a, a proof in, in my book here. Uh, but of course, I can now connect eigenvalues and eigenvectors, which is an algebraic property of the network, 
with a combinatorial property of the network, which is the number of walks. So you are connecting two different areas of mathematics here. So in 2008, we introduced the concept of the communicability between a pair of nodes in the network, in which we take the infinite sum of all the powers of the corresponding adjacent symmetric here pre-multiplied by a parameter that immediately will receive several physical uh, interpretations. And we penalize this by one of the many different ways in which you have to penalize that. But the idea is that the longer walks will receive less weight than the shorter walks. So you are penalized by the factorial, the inverse of the factorial of the length of the walk. And these guarantee that this infinite series converge. And in this particular case, it converts to a matrix function. So don't be confused with the exponential of every entry of the metric. Here, what you have is the exponential of the metric, which is a metric per se. So this is the so-called communicability. And if the two nodes, the starting and ending nodes are the same, we call that self-communicability or subgraph central. So what we are doing in reality is counting here all the by root uh, subgraphs in which the corresponding pair of nodes are taking place. So typically in graph theory, you study root subgraphs or root graphs in which one of the nodes are color, are labeled. But here we have two. And then you see that these two points are here at different positions of all the subgraphs. I have made a truncation here to the a to the power four, but if you continue, what you are going to realize is that you are counting the participation of these two nodes in all the subgraphs that exist in the graph, giving more weight to the shorter ones than to the longer ones. Then immediately we can answer our original question. And then we can say that this particular pair of nodes are more communicated than this particular pair of nodes. I am taking here the parameter beta equal to one. And you can figure out here that the change in the communicability between these two pairs of nodes is about 22%. So it means that if there is a perturbation by the node market in red, the node market in yellow will feel in a 22% more than the uh, node market in blue. Of course, this perturbation can be a physical perturbation if you have a physical network like a vibration in a molecule. It could be uh, related to, mm, let's say, a disease if you are in another kind of network, et cetera. And although we have started from a completely combinatorial uh, idea, what we can do is to give physical interpretations to the, to the meaning of these parameters. One of them was proved in this paper a few years ago in which we consider a network of harmonic oscillators. So we consider that every node of the network has a mass equal to M. They are connected by springs of a spring constant omega. And we tied every one of these nodes to the ground with a force constant, which is much larger than the maximum degree of the nodes in the network. What we are trying to do here is to avoid the displacement, the translational movement of the network. If you consider, for instance, uh, any kind of, of network, you, have, you can have vibrational motion of the nodes due to the perturbations uh, produced by external forces, but there is no translational movement. So we did two approaches. One is the classical one, and if you obtain the thermal green function, it converges to the resolvent of the adjacent symmetric. But if you consider here that uh, there is uh, a quantum system, a quantum harmonic oscillator, in which you have submerged your network into a thermal bath of inverse temperature beta, and in this particular scenario, beta acquires the uh, meaning of an inverse temperature, then the thermal green function of this system is up to physical constants equal to the communicability between a pair of nodes in the corresponding network. Saying in other words, the communicability has the metaphor of being interpreted as how a node, a node in the network feels 
a thermal oscillation produced by the thermal bath in another node in the network. Another possibility of interpreting this has been more recent by Paolo Bartesaghi and myself, in which we consider a susceptible infected, susceptible uh, epidemiological modeling on the network. This is the typical uh, setup for this model. So this is the rate at which the epidemic uh, growth, and this is the rate at which an infected individual cure and become susceptible again, because there is no immunity in the system. And here the trick is to consider that at the very beginning, at time t equals to zero, the probability of every node to get infected is exactly the same, okay? And this probability is much smaller than one. Then we do a trick that was proposed by uh, Lee Tenetti and Yun in uh, 2019, uh, we now are uh, calling it the Lee Tenetti Yun transform, in which you change the probability of getting infected by the node V by minus the logarithm of the probability of not getting infected. So from a statistical point of view, you immediately realize that this is just a surprise of not getting infected, the information content of not getting infected. And then what we do is that we obtain a linearized form of this uh, particular model, which is not divergent. This is the standard linearized form in which, as you already know from kindergarten, as soon as the time increase, it goes even with probability bigger than one, so it is divergent. But here in red, we have the transformation. Here is this variable, but you can immediately obtain the probability of getting infected. And it's an upper bound, which is stable, so it's not exponentially divergent. And what is important is that the only structural term that appears in this uh, uh, solution of the SIS model is the communicability function of the graph. These are parameters that depends only on the initial condition. And these parameters see here uh, tell you the epidemic threshold of the corresponding network. Okay, so communicability has been applied in many, 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 many different scenarios. It's now a standard for the study of brain networks, but I can show you here a few results. There are more than 100 uh, or 200 uh, papers using particularly communicability, for instance, to study fracture in granular material, to identify genes in different uh, setups to use in uh, cancer medicine, uh, semantic analysis, economic and financial crisis. I like this very, very much. It's, uh, it's about pattern recognition of vegetation uh, and pollen uh, uh, patterns in which communicability has been also used. But now the point is to ask the question, how close are a particular pair of nodes in the network in terms of the communicability. So when you talk in colloquial language, you say, okay, Manuel and I are very close friends, okay? However, I have, uh, I have a, a longer distance with my former friend, uh, Pulanito. So you are talking about a metric, a distance in a social network. So a distance, of course, is a, is a proxy of similarity. And then the question here is, can we analyze how close are two networks in uh, our two nodes in a network in terms of their communicability? So we are talking about how close these two nodes are if they are trying to communicate, but most of the information sent to this pair of nodes is echoed to the original node. What happens very recently between uh, Pablo Casado and Isabel Diaz Ayuso. So what one said was not heard by the other, although it was that intention. However, you have the proper transmission of information in which all the information which is departed from the node red arrive at its destination. Okay, so this is when you really receive the letter. This is when the postman arrives at your home, is closed, and it returns the letter to the originator. So in order to see how this coin process is doing, it's simply taking now the root or color or simply color 
uh, uh, subgraphs in the graph. So it's R is the contribution of all the subgraphs in which the node, let's say red, appears as one of the corresponding nodes. So now what we are going to propose here is the difference between these two parameters. My network is symmetric. So it means that whatever is sending by V goes around the network and return to the node V or to the node W, starting at the node, node W and ending at the node W, I consider that has not delivered that a code to the corresponding nodes and return. Now, because the network is symmetric, I am subtracting the transmission. So what I am trying to say just uh, intuitively is that, okay, this is bad for communication. This is good for communication. So if this number is small, there is a good communication. I can say that Manuel and I are close friends if this number in the friendship network is relatively small. Then what we can do is to prove that this is exactly a proper distance in the graph. And not only that it is a distance, but it's Euclidean distance, a characteristic that, for instance, the shortest path distance doesn't have. So you can express this in terms of the eigenvalues and corresponding eigenvectors of the adjacent symmetry. Oh, square here, there is a missing square there. And uh, so you can prove that this is exactly a square Euclidean distance between the corresponding pair of nodes. So here again, in the initial example, what we can say is that this pair of nodes is about 15% closer than this pair of nodes in terms of their communicability. So, of course, you can now prove a little bit more and you can prove that this distance induce an embedding of the network of any network into an n-dimensional sphere, Euclidean sphere. So here, what you have is for the three-dimensional case, the nodes will be placed in the surface of the sphere. The communicability distance is the core between the corresponding uh, pair of nodes. There is a position vector here pointing to the position of the nodes in the surface. And you have an angle here. Uh, OK, so an angle here, which is given by the communicability and the self-communicability between the corresponding nodes. Well, if you are in a mountain, if you are here at this point in the mountain, of course, you have a distance to this other top of the other mountain. This is exactly what the communicability distance is telling you, is the separation between these two points. This is a valuable information for an eagle because the eagle can fly directly from this point to the other, but not for you, because you have to go here, down and then up. So you have, you have to travel by the geodesic in this particular length space. So then we need to do a geometrization of the network. And this geometrization of the network is carried out by simply taking every edge and to every edge to assign one particular interval to one particular edge, which is between zero and the corresponding communicability distance between this pair of nodes. If you extend now this to all the edges and notice the following, this is a local property because I am just assigning this to an edge, but this contains global property of the graph. So then if I extend this, I have a length of space and now I can see the communicability shortest path between pairs of nodes. Suppose that you have these two nodes here, P and Q, and I will analyze this path, P1, and this path, P2. So if I take now the sum of this communicability length for this path, I will obtain the value of 5.09, whatever it means. If I take here this other longer path, in terms of number of steps, it gives me smaller communicability distance than the previous one. So what this means, this is indicating you that going by this route 
is shorter than going by this route. Of course, if you are a random walker, you are completely drunk, you don't have a map, GPS, etc. Every time that you arrive at this position, you have one third of probability of going here, here, or here. Suppose that you have gone here, you are not returning to the original place, but you still have one half probability of going here and here. So you can go here, you are not returning, you have one half and one half probability. So you can end up at the original place many times during your realizations. If you do it in this way, you have one probability of one probability, one probability. Every time you realize this walk, you will end up in four steps. However, here you can even do a looping of infinite length, okay? So this has been applied and already a little bit problematic with time. So this has been applied to pattern recognition and classification, particularly for identifying cancer genes. In Alzheimer disease, uh, for not only differentiating between uh, early stage of Alzheimer disease uh, from healthy uh, people, but also to identify those regions in which the communicability drops in comparison with healthy people. Uh, there has been an analysis of traffic uh, with real data um, about traffic in rush hour. This was published in Nature Human Behavior. And uh, what you will observe in this particular uh, setup is that in several cities around the world, drivers at rush hour prefer to go by longer paths, which are shorter in terms of communicability than by going through the shortest path. So not only in the brain, what you can say, okay, this is proper diffusion, but even in a city, when you have GPS, maps, et cetera, you also prefer not to go by the shortest path because possibly it's going to more traffic lights, more uh, 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 traffic, and uh, you will waste more time than going through the longer, but longer in terms of steps, but shorter in terms of communicability path. Also for financial risk and uh, financial systems, you are able to identify which of these companies in uh, finance and financial systems are more at risk of getting bankruptcy than others. And here, uh, the temperature plays an important role because you can change this parameter, which could be the external noise to the system. And you can see, for instance, here that there are crossing between the risk. So it's not the same to say that these two are one at the lower risk and the other at the higher risk, because it depends on the external level of noise that the system has. If this change, this can be swapped, like in this particular case. We found analytically a few results about this. So ending a little bit late, the first part. So let me move to the second one. So no local dynamics. This is the cover of, uh, of uh, uh, a rock uh, song. I found this and uh, I think uh, the, the random walks here are very easily to identify. Well, in several experimental setups, but because uh, I think this is very appealing, uh, you can find the following situations. For instance, uh, in this study, and PRL in 2012, the authors study uh, very low temperature, or what is called coal atoms, the diffusion of coal atoms experimentally. This particular case was uh, Rubidium uh, 87. They have a setup of uh, lattice beans and, and so forth. And what they observe is that the diffusion of these uh, atoms was far from normal. So if the uh, full width of the half maximum of the atoms were diffusing as a normal diffusion, let's say a typical Gaussian diffusion that we study in the school, we will observe this curve here. So we will have that the mean square displacement scale linearly with time, that the solution of my approach is just a Gaussian and the full width of the half maximum scale with the square root of time. But what they observe experimentally is that the mean square displacement scale with t to a power alpha in which alpha is larger than one, that the full width of the half uh, maximum scale with t to the alpha uh, with alpha larger than one half, 
and the distribution that they observe is far from being a Gaussian. It's like a campsite, and this kind of distribution is known as the stable distribution. Of course, the stable distribution generalizes the Gaussian one, so the Gaussian distribution is a particular case of the, uh, of the stable distribution. So in this particular setup, what we have uh, made is to generalize the Laplacian operator. So I suppose that all of you know what the Laplacian operator is. Uh, you can formulate these Laplacian, Laplacian operators in general in Hilbert L2 space. And uh, the normal Laplacian operator take any function, let's say define it over the complex numbers for a particular vertex of the graph and take the sum of the difference between the function applied to the particular node you are analyzing minus all the nearest neighbors of that node. So this is the classical Laplacian, the standard Laplacian. What we are doing is to take in this difference, not with the nearest neighbors, but with all neighbors which are at exactly the steps from the particular node. So the shortest path distance between the node V and the node W here need to be equal to D. Of course, if D is equal to one, we recover the standard Laplacian. So we can generalize the degree of a node. Instead of counting the number of nearest neighbors, I count the neighbors at these steps from a particular node uh, V. So let's say that all the W, such as the shortest path distance with V is equal to D. Now I have this normal classical expression for the Laplacian. Instead of having the degree here, I have the generalized degree and minus one if and only if the distance between these two corresponding nodes is exactly equal to D. Again, if D is equal to one, this is the standard Laplacian. Then I make a transform of this generalized Laplacian in such a way that what this Laplacian is doing is just telling you that there should be a process of agreement between pair of nodes which are separated at distance D. In the normal standard Laplacian, what you have is an agreement process between nearest neighbors. Of course, you can imagine physical process in which people try to make agreement if they are separated at distance two or distance three, but it's a little bit freaky. And then what we are doing is to consider that these agreements can be made for any pair of nodes at any distance, but such as this distance influence in an inverse way to the uh, power in which this agreement is made. So it means that I take the sum of D, which is the distance to minus a power S in which S is the strength of these interactions multiplied by the D path Laplacians. Of course, I can now, well, I can now generalize the diffusion process. So if I have the derivative in, of, let's say concentration of particles in time, is equal to minus L U T with initial condition given by this vector. Uh, these are vectors, of course. And what I am doing is just replacing this by the sum of D to minus S L D from D equal to one to the diameter of the corresponding graph. Okay, so what I am doing is telling the system that this diffusion process can occur not only by making an agreement between pair of nodes which are connected, but also by nodes which are separated at the distance D, such as the strength of this agreement decays with the corresponding distance. Now, if you do this, what we prove analytically is that when this parameter S is exactly between one and three, you have super diffusion. However, if S is a strictly larger than three, then what you have is normal diffusion. So we are able to reproduce the experimental results obtained in that particular experimental setup by considering the transformed d path Laplacians with this particular transformation, which is known as the Mayin transform. For other transforms, like the exponential one, the, the Laplace transform, 
it never happens to occur super, super diffusion. So you can accelerate this process, but the scaling with time is always linear for the mean square displacement. You have, okay. Okay, so you can see here, of course, if you are in the non super diffusive uh, regime, what you observe is certain kind of acceleration. So here you can see the concentration at the initial node here at time t is about 0.8, here is 0 0.03, so it's a very uh, significant drop. But when you enter into the super diffusive regime, you can observe the typical shape of the stable distribution, the type of camp site one. And of course, see that at time t equal to zero, you have practi practically the equilibration of the steady state of the system. Well, we have done the same for uh, two dimensions, but let me show you how we have been uh, applying this very recently. So this is information provided by the group of Gundus. Uh, they consider uh, tissues in different kind of uh, cancer uh, in humans. So in this particular case, these are gliomas, which are uh, cancers in brain, and they transform this information into graphs. So really what they do is just to take the coordinates of the nuclei of the cells, considering them as uh, the nodes of the network, and then by proximity, they obtain the connections between the corresponding nodes. And the main point here is to try to differentiate tissues coming from glioma and from inflamed uh, tissues. So it's relatively easy to differentiate healthy from unhealthy ones, but it's very tough to differentiate between these two. So what we have done is just to consider in here the distance, the communicability distance based on the deep path Laplacians transformed by the main transform and the normal diffusive distance between the corresponding nodes. And what we observe very easily is that we can separate the group of healthy tissues from those which are unhealthy, mainly by the contribution of non-local interactions. So what we can say clearly here is that while in healthy tissues, the diffusive process are dominated by normal diffusion, in glioma and in flame, what we have is a complete domination of non-local or super diffusive uh, diffusion. However, to differentiate between these two, we need the local diffusive distance, telling you that the uh, in flame, uh, pairs of nodes are better communicated at the local diffusion than the glioma ones. If you try the same with another approach, which is the fractional Laplacian introduced by Riasco San Mateos in 2012, what you observe is that there is no separation at all between the three classes. And you can try by many different arrangements of parameters and you can see that it's very, very difficult to separate between these two classes here. In this particular scenario, the results are bad for the three classes, but in general, you have a good separation between healthy and the other two, but not a good separation between these two. This is up to, uh, up to what time? 3.30, is that correct? 3.30? Yes, okay. So let me go to the next topic, uh, which is about bias Laplacians. So here you have the kind of standard process, which is modeled by the standard Laplacian, okay? Whatever the process, it could be diffusion, it could be synchronization. Typically, once you have the particle, which is moving in your network at a given node, the probability that this particle move to any of the nearest neighbors depends only on the degree of the particle in which, of the degree of the node in which the particle is located at time t. So what this means that it is independent on how connected, well or bad connected are any of these nearest neighbors. So the probability of a random walker to move to this node here is one over the degree of this node. To move to this one is one over the degree of this node. And to move to this one is one over the degree 
of i. So we can consider that there are certain scenarios in which this is not necessarily the case. So we can have, for instance, a process in which the hubs attract the particle, or there are scenarios in which the hubs repel the particle. So in the physics literature, uh, there has been, particularly for the case of random walks, attempts to study the uh, degree bias random walks. So it's a kind of generalization in which what we are going to propose are the corresponding Laplacian matrices for these particular setups. And here we have our original definition, but now this difference is weighted by this ratio between the degree of the corresponding nodes that I am analyzing and the degree of any of the nearest neighbors of these nodes. And all of this is raised to the parameter alpha, which here takes only the value of minus one and one. You can immediately see that if alpha is equal to minus one, what you have is a half subtracting. And if you have alpha equal to one, you have a half repelling. So now by changing these two parameters or this parameter to these two values, uh, of course, you can consider this as a continuum of values between one and minus one. We have not done this yet. Interestingly, so what you have here are the Laplacians and the new Laplacian, the Hubs biased Laplacians. Let me clarify something here by Hubs. So what I am saying is not that the absolute half of the network is attracting globally the particle. What I am saying is that if the particle is here and it has three nearest neighbors, the one with the highest degree attracts more the particle than the one with the lowest degree. Is that okay? So here what I have is that I have transformed the undirected graph into a directed or bidirected weighted graph. So it seems like I'm complicating the, the problem. So the Laplacian matrix in this particular case is non-symmetric, but it's quasi-reciprocal. A matrix is reciprocal if the entry Aij is equal to one over Aji. A matrix is reciprocal if Ii is equal to zero for all i, let's say that belongs to the matrix uh, M, and i a i j is equal to one over j i for all i j. Okay, now this is called quasi reciprocal because the main diagonal is not zero. Okay, but observe that if I have minus two third here, I have minus three half here and so forth. However, we know that introducing non-symmetry into matrices use it to complicate the algebraic work. So the first result is very important because we prove that these two matrices have real spectrum. So although the matrices are non-symmetric, their spectrum is formed only by real eigenvalues. So they are positive semi-definite. It means that no eigenvalue is negative. The rank of these matrices is equal to the number of nodes minus the number of connected components in the graph, exactly the same as for the particular case of the standard Laplacian. And they can be diagonalized. So we don't have any problem to work algebraically with these matrices. So now what we do is simply introduce uh, a diffusive process. We have done the same with synchronization in which we replace the standard Laplacian with the Hubs bias Laplacian. We prove that this process always converge for any initial condition to this particular agreement set. But what is telling you is that the difference between the states of the nodes at the time tending to infinite goes to zero. Uh, we also prove that if these are the eigenvalues of the uh, half bias Laplacian, the dynamical process depends, the rate of convergence of the dynamical process depends on the second smallest eigenvalue 
of the corresponding Laplace. So the non-trivial or algebraic connectivity of the, this particular Laplace. I will skip this. Okay, let me show you one example. So here I have this particular uh, simple graph, it's a tree, in which I will locate the diffusive particle at the node one. And I will analyze what happened with the standard Laplacian, normal Laplacian, the half subtracting and the half repelling. So in this particular scenario, in the standard Laplacian, well, what we observe is that in just 30 tiny steps, there is convergence. Uh, there is a trapping at the very beginning around here. And then the particle diffuse to have the same concentration or the steady state in the whole graph. In the half subtracting, the process is accelerated. So the time at which the particle is concentrated or localized at the initial state is very short. However, in the Hubs repelling, see that the convergence goes over there. Why? Because now the particle is trapped in the initial state. So remember, this node has only one nearest neighbor and this nearest neighbor has a degree the only one. So it means that this particle will try not to go in this direction because it has been repelled by this one. Even if this degree is equal to two, you will see what happens if I put the particle here or here. Okay, so there is a delay in the diffusive process here. Okay, so if the particle is at the center, it's more or less exactly the same. So now what happened is that if the particle is here and I have the Hubs repelling, it can go here or here. But the problem is that this has a degree larger than this. So it will prefer to go here. And once it is in any of these nodes, it gets trapped because it cannot return to this hub, which is repelling very dramatically the particle. And finally, I will place the particle here. See. You know that this process converge, so you will reach always the steady state. But the problem here is the dynamics. See how much concentrated this particle is in the Hubs repelling around this point. And here the Hubs attracting is much favored. See the orders of magnitude here of the concentration at the given time. So then you can have different scenarios for different type of Laplacian Hubs bias Laplacians. Let me show you very quickly one potential kind of applications. Suppose that you have the network of airports in one particular country, continent, or whatever, and you have a time delay in the flights. Now you have two possibilities that this time delay is absorbed independently of the number of connections that the airport has, so the importance of the airport, or that the hubs in this can absorb very easily this uh, time delay. In this particular case, it means if there is a time delay in one flight and arrive to a hub, that the flights in the hub altogether delays. Or we can have the hubs repelling approach in which if there is a time delay in one particular airport, the hubs doesn't matter. They have too many flights, they have too many connections as to be affected by this time delay. So what happened with the standard uh, Laplacian in a purely diffusive process, so no way to the edges, no number of passengers, nothing like that. Okay, is that almost the whole continental airport are affected even if the initial state is just one particular uh, delay in one airport, and even Alaska has been affected. Of course, the hubs attracting is even worse. So this is telling you that a hub will be dramatically affected by a time delay, and then of course it will immediately propagate to the rest of the, of the network. And this is the hubs repelling. It delays more, but then the delay is very much localized to a given particular region of the network. And if you observe the experimental result by Flerkin, Jose Ramasco, that would be around here, and Victor uh, Egilus, uh, you will observe that for a flight delay here, 
it is mainly concentrated into a particular region of the network and not fully propagated even at a long, uh, relatively long time. So then, of course, placing these hubs repelling uh, Laplacians into more appropriate data-driven setups could bring more information about the uh, what is happening there. So finally, uh, let me tell you that, uh, for finally for this part, that we have also uh, analyzed the transpose of these uh, hubs bias operators, uh, which in general for uh, the case of infinite graph corresponds to the uh, adjoin of these operators. And we first discovered that these transpose operator control a kind of process, which is an adventure at bench <laughs> process in the graph. So what it means, okay, so you typically have that if you put some uh, drops of ink in a, in a tank, for instance, you have the typical diffusive motion. But if you open uh, uh, this uh, tank to the to outside, so it will be a drift that will attract these particles in a, in a way of an advective motion. So then what we are doing here uh, with uh, Manuel Miranda, who started the PhD in last uh, September, is to combine this advective uh, uh, process with a diffusive one into one particular equation controlled by these two parameters here that tell you how important is one of the processes uh, respect to the other. So what kind of diffusive advective process we have in nature? foraging, for instance. You have a gang of uh, pack of animals and they are foraging here in a diffusive way. But now the food here is scarce, so they have to move to another region, moved by the drift of the abundance of the food. And this was exactly one of the examples that we study. And uh, we study the motion of the Lemurkata in the Southern Madagascar, uh, experimentally determined by uh, colleagues ecologists that this is the network. In this particular case, you have a directed and weighted network. And then we analyze it, the hubs repelling at the hubs attracting uh, by considering that the advective diffusion is cyclic. So that the animals goes to diffusion, then goes to advection and then diffusion and so forth. But we got, because we have real data, we fit the parameters of these coefficients here to reproduce the best, the flow of animals of Lemurkata in this particular scenario. And then what we have here is that this process is mainly diffusive, but with an important contribution of advention. And more importantly, that this is a hubs attracting kind of process. Of course, the hubs attraction here emerge from the abundance of food in the particular patches of the uh, corresponding network. So finally, I will talk about systems with memory. So I forget to put something here, my memory. Uh, so we have the same problem here, but what happened is that the system remembers. I will immediately explain what it means. So what we are doing is that what you have been observed so far in your career is that we typically take here the first derivative, the second derivative, the third derivative of a variable equal to a given function of this particular variable, concentration, opinion, whatever. What I am doing now is to change this derivative by a fractional derivative, the 0 0.5 derivative, the 0 0.1 derivative, the 1.3 derivative, et cetera, et cetera. In particular, I will take this fractional derivative in this way, and I have written this in a very simple way. This is called the Caputo fractional derivative. There are many, the Lehman reveal uh, and several others. So this is just one, the inverse of the gamma function of one minus alpha. Alpha is the parameter that you will be immediately identified with memory. And now I have an integral of my first derivative here multiplied by a weight. And this weight is given by the time at which I am integrating, so that the upper bound of the integration and the time at which I am integrating that rise to the power alpha. So uh, it 
it doesn't matter here. This was just necessary for the general case. So here I am moving for alpha between zero and one. I can generalize this to any alpha, of course. Okay, let me give you the interpretation of this. Suppose that you have a function. Oop, 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 oop. You have a function here that depends on t. Okay, so this is your function, whatever the motion or something that depends on t. So here you have the variable t. And because I have an integral here, I will do something that you learn in kindergarten calculus, the trapezoidal method for approximating the area below a curve and calculating an integral. Do you remember that? Okay, so kindergarten. So I will make a subdivision of this space of integration between zero and a into k different regions. And I can do k as large as I want because I am not doing any calculation. This is just a theoretical idea. So then the width of these trapezoids here could be equal to h. So now what I will do, well, this was done by Odibat, is just to calculate this parameter here. See, it looks complex, but it's very simple. This is just h, the width, this is gamma. And these are the parameters at which I am doing the partition here. K is the number of partitions, blah, blah, blah. This is the first derivative evaluated at the point zero. This is all the derivative evaluated at the intermediate points. And this is just the uh, first derivative at the point A. And what he proved is that the fractional derivative is equal to this parameter plus the error. But I will make the error zero because if I take an infinite number of partitions and I don't care because I'm not doing the calculation. So I will say that these two things are identical, okay? Now here goes the rock and roll. So see what happened if alpha is equal to one. Well, this is one, gamma of two is one. So this parameter is one. Now I am evaluating here the derivative at the point zero. If this is the point A, this could be the present time because this is time. This is the most recent time. This is present. So if this is present and in our civilization, moving in this direction means the past. So zero is the remote past. So here, this part of the summation is the contribution of the remote past. This is the contribution of the recent past. And this is the contribution of the present. Of course, if alpha is equal to one, this is zero. You can do the math. This is zero. And what you have is that you learn it in first year calculus, that this derivative is just a slope of this curve, particularly at this time, which represents the present. Now, what happens if alpha is between zero and one is that this is different from zero. So I have a contribution of the recent past and I have a contribution of the remote past. And these contributions decays with alpha. So if alpha moved to one, you can see that these contributions goes to zero. So as you consider alpha from zero to one, zero means that you have a perfect memory of the system in the past. And one means that you have absolutely no memory and you concentrate only in the present. So what happened in the real world? Well, if you check many of the system that has been analyzed by fractional derivative, you can observe that most of the value of alpha with one extension here that we can uh, just uh, uh, leave apart are not very dramatic. So the systems, the complex systems has memory, but not perfect memory. And this is logical because we have external noise, we have uh, uh, oscillations, perturbation, fluctuations, etc. So then we can redo some of the things that we have been doing before. And in this particular case, we have rewritten the uh, susceptible infected model. But in this particular scenario, considering memory, then you have the upper bound solution that we have found before. But in this particular case, instead of the exponential, what we have is this particular function, which are called the meta leffler matrix functions of the network. See that if alpha is equal to one, gamma of k plus one is the factorial of k. 
So then I recover the exponential. So this is a generalization of the previous model. Where this has been applied? Well, this has been applied, for instance, in studying the inhibitors of the uh, protease of the uh, SARS-CoV-2. And we discovered in this paper that the most potent uh, uh, inhibitors of the SARS-CoV-2, by the way, the one commercialized by uh, Pfizer use this mechanism of action uh, are those in which the transmission of the effects of this perturbation that we were analyzing at the beginning are at a longer particular range. It's like if the system considers certain kind of memory in the transmission of the, this effect. And very finally, this is uh, just a paper by Bernardo, which is uh, here who also started working with me in September. And uh, we have generalized it now the most general diffusion equation that you can have. Because we have here the deep path Laplacian transformed by the main transformation. So you have long range spatial interactions and you have fractional time derivative. So the solution of this is given by the middle Leffler functions of this the path Laplacians. And the most important thing is that we have been able to, with only one equation, reproduce super diffusive normal diffusion, which is just this particular line of this space of S versus alpha and sub diffusive processes. So, where are these three processes combined, for instance? In the exploration and repair that transcription factors do of the DNA. So this is a DNA, so I can represent this as a line. And this is a transcription factor, so this is my particle. So the transcription factor need to explore the whole of the DNA. So sometimes it do slicing, it move in a diffusive way, but sometimes it has to repair one uh, nucleotide here. So it has stopped there to do some work. So the motion is subdiffusive. But sometimes it do some hopping. It goes two or three steps. So it disentangle and then go and move. And sometimes it do this intersegmental transfer in which duping this, doing this kind of looping, it can move from this original position to a very far position doing some kind of super diffusive motion. So this is an example where you can consider and we have obtain some results here. So I have just one minute here. And just to relax, you know that Euler is written like this, but it's pronounced Euler. So one of my students one day was uh, saying that he has solved or she has solved a problem by using Euler formula. So I was inspired and wrote this poem. Euler, Euler, the students cry, as they has friction with pi and i. Master Euler came to see and solve the problem inventing E. Only a master Euler, as Euler can, equate these three to minus one. A picture of Euler is on my wall, as he's the master Euler of Oscar. Questions. Okay, thank thank you so much, Ernesto, for the for the amazing talk and also for the poetry at this point. So <laughs> everything. So okay, so we are a bit late, but we have time for um, for quick questions. So I don't know if there in the in the room there is someone or otherwise in online. Just yes, okay. uh, yeah. you need to. I don't know if it is open the microphone. I don't know. I don't know. It's, it's just for the transcription. Can, can you hear me? Yeah, no. now yes. Yeah. Okay, so thank you for the talk. And I'm a bit confused about the this uh, thing of the communi communicability that you, you started mm -hmm. with that. Because for me, the transmission of information is related with the dynamics that you define in the network. In, and your measure is just 
uh, it just takes the topology, right? Mm -hmm. to, to measure the com communicability. Mm -hmm. So are you, uh, do, are you supposing some kind of dynamics that it, the processes are always diffusive, diffusive or, or it doesn't have to do anything with the dynamics? Or? Okay, thank you very much. So if you are only confused by that, you are very well. So um, the point is the following. You can consider any process independently of the process if this process is allowed to consider all the potential routes to go from one place to the other. So in principle, any diffusive or diffusive-like kind of process goes this way. If you don't have this kind of process, let's say that you are directing the message from one place to the other, then you don't need even a dynamic. So you simply say, okay, so this is the route that you hold A, B, B, C, D, E. But if in one particular of these points, there is a congestion and you need to return in order to redirect, then this is valid approach. So I recommend uh, a famous paper by, by Will uh, about the strange, uh, uh, oh, I don't, don't remember the title, but it's about the strange um, uh, nature of mathematics in, in, in physical laws. And uh, at the very beginning, there is an anecdote. Well, I, I suppose it's a joke. And uh, I said that there are two, two fellows and then uh, they found after their graduation and um, their school, one of them went to academic and the other mm, was doing whatever. And then the, the non-academic asked the other, what do you do? And they said, well, I write papers. And then he showed a paper. And then the guy said, oh, what is this? And this is, this is pi. And this is, what is the paper about? This is about population dynamics. And what is pi? Well, pi is related to the, uh, circumference of the, uh, the, the, the ratio of the circumference and, and, uh, and the length of the, the radius. And then the guy said, well, you are pushing your joke too much. What the circumference has to do with, um, with population dynamics. So the point is that you can find the same mathematical framework in many different contexts. So diffusion. So if you study diffusion of the heat equation, for instance, uh, the Laplace equation, uh, you can consider that what is happening there is just the diffusion of, of heat. Then you can move to concentration. You have the diffusive coefficient, you have Darcy conditions, blah, 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 but it's the same equation. But if you go to how drones or robots in general goes to consensus, if you type in Google consensus protocol, what you will discover is this is exactly the same heat equation. And there is no heat at all over there, but there is a kind of process that when it is taken into account, what you are taking is all the potential routes of communication between the points or the nodes in the graph. So that's why you have more than one interpretation. So you can, you can see here when I started, this is just the thermal green function of a network of quantum harmonic oscillators, but it's also related to the susceptible infected susceptible epidemic transmission, and you can find more, okay? Thank you. Uh, yes. All that process that you're telling, and I suppose are always have linear dynamics on them, no? If you have no linear dynamics, you cannot use this equation for <laughs> solving the transmission, no? Yes, so uh, this, is, this is a very recurring question. So uh, you are using linear dynamics, are you using nonlinear dynamics? No, I'm not using linear nonlinear dynamics, but you can extend this to any nonlinear dynamics. Well, uh, we have a study, for instance, the, the incorporation of these long range effects into the Schrodinger equation, and then you, you can have certain kind, but it's a linear as well, but you can have uh, quantum effects. But you can do, uh, well, we have, we have done something in synchronization with Rossler oscillators and, and things like that. But from, um, let's say, from a mathematical point of view, there would be difference from the physical point of view as well. But from the conceptual point of view, it's exactly the same. So you have a process controlled by the standard Laplacian or even by other operators. So you can have the adjacency operator. For instance, if you are studying tie binding Hamiltonians in, uh, in solids, so you can generalize this. We have done this for, for studying quantum interference, for instance, in molecules. And then you can simply replace this operator by the generalized operator, okay? So yes, I could be interested in, in this line of approach, but it's not my area of expertise, nonlinear dynamical process, but yes. Okay, thank you.
Okay, just Brian, if you have time for just one quick question, or if we run any, we can just thank again Ernesto. So, anything else? Okay, if there are no other questions. So, sorry? No, here nobody is, uh, is rising. Okay, okay, so I think that we can go. Thank you again, Ernesto, for the very instructive talk. Lots of new, open new things. Thank you so much. And see you next. See you next week with our seminars. And in the meanwhile, uh, remember that in the next few days we will um, we will post, let's say, new the uh, um, the events of the other the other uh, talks by Ernesto. Okay, thank you so much. Bye bye.